best band. What's that? It um, sounds so good. <laughs> well, I think we hope it is good. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. Uh, Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund um, has been, is, was established in 2016 to really support uh, the conservation of biodiversity, of the fabric of life, essentially, uh, in Uganda. And of course, we work with, with NEMA. Yeah. Every time he comes here, I tell him he's doing a bad job. Uh, so I'm going to tell you, uh, Dr. Helga Reina, you're doing a bad job. <laughs> because uh, this, this swamp feeling, you know, it's happening. It happened last night and it happens at night. This is, you know, I live just 14 kilometers away from Kampala. So what are you conserving? I think there's a lot that does need to be conserved. I think that there are a lot of challenges. Um, but I think also within all the work that does need to be done, there are some, some good stories. There are some reasons for hope. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. No, no, go on. Oh, yeah, some, of yeah. the, some of the hopeful stories? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, we see, you know, we see areas that are uh, being protected. We do see some increases in wildlife numbers, for example. We do see some increases in protection of forests. But that doesn't mean to say that the situation isn't uh, challenging and that there isn't a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so whilst I think we do have sort of the capacity and the ability to do more, we really do need to lean in a lot more uh, to make those changes. Mm. When, when they say conservation funding, what does that mean? So this is really about, and this is sort of the focus of the Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund, is really to uh, try and find primarily financial resources that are directed towards protection of nature, right? So that is kind of the central role uh, that the Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund has kind of been given the mandate to do, um, because that's one of one of the challenges is um, a lack of sufficient financial resources being directed towards protection yeah. uh, of nature. And, and if we accuse you of only being interested in wild animals, not the landfills in Chigo, Bududa, recently um, uh, happened, and here we are talking about a conservation fund when those catastrophes are happening. The rains are back, so we're not so sure how well planned you are for that. Well, I mean, it's the Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund. It's not the Uganda Wildlife Fund. Um, and biodiversity is everything. Everything, mm. you know, all plants, animals, fungi, microorganisms. Um, and it's about that fabric of life, that the way that all those organisms interact to sort of create this environment that enables us as humans as well as everything else to thrive. So our focus isn't just on, on wildlife. Um, it does include the wetlands. It includes everything, really. And it's also about maintaining the diversity, right? It's not just about having one, just one animal or just one plant thriving. It's about all of those um, mm. different creatures uh, coexisting. I, 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 I hope members on the panel here will agree with you because Agnes here is from Amolata and, and Katesh mm. is from uh, Bushen? Shema. Shema. So, it but, is but, eh? It is Bushen. Bushen is divided Shema. in two villages <laughs> and he represents one of those. So, who, who, just a final question to you. Who funds you? Is it the government of Uganda that funds you? Because you're a fund after all. Correct. Um, and so um, at the moment, we're being funded by uh, donors. Uh, our primary fund uh, donors are USAID and the European Union. Um, we are a young fund. We were only uh, started in 2016. Um, and we've also been able to try and raise some funds sort of independently um, with the goal to sort of create a much larger fund. Um, and then those resources can be kind of deployed to mm to the areas that, that they may be needed. Yeah. Uh, number seven, before, uh, uh, before uh, Nema comes in. Yeah. And I am sorry. Um, no, go on. I, up to now, I don't understand what they are. Uh -huh. um, forgive me. I remember when I chaired the committee that uh, Joel is chairing. The auditor general presented a report to parliament, reporting that government didn't know how many parastatos it had. And entities where it had shares. Yeah. So I want to know whether this thing is government, whether it is private, and I am sorry, but I don't know it. I am hearing it for the first time. 
Yeah, and, and for you, first yeah. time as well, you're hearing about it? No, I've heard about them. Just, if you've heard about them, just stop for a minute. Let's catch uh, uh, Dr. Barirega first. Uh, BA, as I told you many times, when you come to gang, I say, today I'll just say, because you've made me look good, I say, your job is not so good. Hey, my job is not so good yeah. because Ugandans make it hard, but when you work together, well, it will uh, be good. An, an MP uh, does not know the biodiversity fund. I don't know. Land well, I, 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 I can clarify, Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund is not a government agency, neither does government have shares in it. It is a, uh, a fund that has been set up to support government uh, in financing conservation, because one of the challenges of conservation in Uganda is actually financing. Whereas uh, conservation-based resources, whereas conservation-based resources like wildlife, like water, like uh, uh, like wetlands, trees, uh, are the the foundations of economic development and they contribute significantly to the economy. Uh, we still need more investment in conservation, and we welcome partners like Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund to supplement government efforts in financing conservation. And uh, we, 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 we invite uh, government, especially the MPs uh, who are here, who are in charge of appropriation, uh, to follow suit and also allocate more resources, uh, more government resources to conservation so that we can uh, make, uh, do a good job. Oscar here tells me the job is very bad. The job is very bad because we are not investing in it. And uh, like I always say, Conservation without financing is a conversation. We just come here, converse, talk about today things. Without investing in conservation, it remains just a conversation. And so we welcome uh, and thank uh, the Biodiversity Trust Fund and its partners uh, for working with the government, for supporting government efforts, for supplementing government in uh, promoting conservation of our natural resources. Mm. How, how can the fund help you with Bududa? The, the the this fund is becoming the, an everyday thing. Yes, the fund can fund uh, so many conservation projects on the ground. The fund can fund communities, for example, and educate them about sustainable uh, uh, soil conservation, about better methods of farming. Uh, because the issue of Budu Dalajre is really about ecosystems management. The hill areas are not planted with trees that hold the, 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 the ground. Instead, we continue to see cultivation and settlement in these sensitive areas. And with the climate change now, science tells us that any one, change, one degree change uh, in the temperatures results in a 70% change uh, in, a, uh, in, in a evaporation rate, meaning that we get more moisture seven times more moisture if we have one change in the temperature, one degree change in temperature. And this small moisture, when it goes up there, uh, it creates erratic rainfall, uh, which we experience down as erratic floods. So we must work together to support the communities to improve uh, methods of farming, to improve uh, management of ecosystems through simple things, by the way, things like terracing, things like mulching, things like tree planting. These things are not rocket science. They are possible, and mm. they can be done. Mm. Um, Agnes Atim Apea, MP, Amolata District, you have heard of uh, the, the Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund. Biodiversity Trust Fund. Yes, and is it helping in your constituency? I think knowing I, about... And I think mm. that's why I wanted to ask that question, how, how long have they been around? Six years. Six years. Mm. I don't know whether they know about Amolata district, which is one of the lowest land area in the country, that when it just drops, now almost five villages are flooded. Mm. Only that, uh, unfortunately, people, or is it the media or something, they don't focus in some of those things. And yet, actually, uh, being in the middle of two lakes, for us, we wait when it is water, it comes. When it is drought, we are at the extreme. And I was also asking the same thing as my colleague had asked that, yes, I know about biodiversity, I've heard about them, but most of these NGOs are very good at really, um, you know, contextualizing issues, but it's a little hard to find them in, in, on the ground. Like I would say mm. in a Molata. We, we have discussed, Where uh, there should example, have been the ecosystem the management. Mm. They would have expected really to hear or, yeah. or felt them. 
And if we are, if you're having floods, for example, yeah. how are you managing all that water? The it would, water it would be exactly. really good to have some kind of converse, conservation of such water yeah, exactly. for so the future. I, I think I share the same um, mm. kind of feeling that, yes, we have these very good ideas, but having them actualize and making the people who are affected by these issues feel them is mm. something else that we need to, I think, yeah. engage on a bit more. But, but what's happening in your constituency now? No, it, there is flooding now. Okay. And especially... Uh, mm. When it rains, mm. and uh, not necessarily the, the, the rainwater, there is a way, like he was talking, the, 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 the environmentalists will tell you, the, the lake checks itself a bit. It receives more water, so it goes to more areas. And uh, Nema tells us, is it two, 200 meters? 200 meters, From yes. the lake, but for the case of Amolatar, it's no longer 200 meters. When the flood comes, it goes up to like a kilometer or two. And this place is almost the whole parish or the whole village. So, so I think science also needs to be a bit more practical to tell our people what is it really. No, honorable, the, 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 the science is not the problem. Mm. The 200 meters uh, lake shore buffers uh, were meant for slight lake fluctuations. Mm. Now, what we are experiencing is not normal uh, slight lake fluctuations. What we are experiencing is uh, decimation of wetland cover. The wetlands are supposed to hold this water and allow it to sink underground, to recharge underground uh, water aquifers or underground water stores. Mm -hmm. But what is happening, uh, the wetlands have been converted into agricultural fields. These are rice fields. So they no longer hold the water. So all of the water ends up going into the lake. And so the lakes are receiving more water than the ordinary water. So what we are seeing is really not the normal lake breathing. But, 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 but Dr. Variega, uh, uh, the question to you is, what is new? Exactly. What, what is new mm, is... Even not when you knew last year. <laughs> no, we knew, but mm. what is new is that we must continuously engage our people mm. to change behavior, and we start respecting and working in harmony with nature. That is what must be new. The behavior remains uh, aggressive to nature, and the nature continues to fight back, that fight cannot be won, as you know. So we need to change behavior and come back to the fold and say, we can live in harmony with nature. We make our agriculture where we are supposed to have it and leave wetlands where they are supposed to be, leave hills where they are supposed to be, so that there is no fighting. We can't win a war with nature. So behavior change is the issue, Oscar. OK, Let, let's, let's see what is happening in Shema. I know what's happening here in Nakawa for Joe Senyonyi. But, uh, well, mm. uh, first of all, what I wanted to say is that uh, we are a country where some of the problems we have are actually solutions of the other and uh, vice versa. Because we experienced, we experienced drought in the same equal me measure as we experienced flooding. Mm. And one of those is a solution to the other. If we are able to conserve the, the water, to use it during the dry season, mm. like uh, Honorable Agnes is uh, constituent. Yeah, there, there are some repairs going on in the neighborhood. I'll just ask you to be a little bit louder yeah. so that our voices are louder so, than the repairs. So I, I think as a country, we have not, we have not, uh, we have not utilized um, the challenges to, to, to actually solve the problems we have. Do, do you in Shema have any people that harvest water? Yes, we do. Mm. But uh, we, we, when, we, like now in the recent uh, months, right. it mm. was completely dry. But right now, you'll find that places are flooded. Now, what I seem to pick from, uh, from uh, the efforts by mm. uh, NEMA and the, the Biodiversity the Bi Trust Fund, I think for me, first of all, this is a, a fund that is donor funded, right? It, it asks questions whether actually as a country we appreciate issues of biodiversity and conservation. I think what we need to see is how do we get people to appreciate and sensitize people across the board to understand that the environment matters. Because uh, these efforts that this fund is doing they are just a drop in the ocean. We need a mass action that will get people to appreciate. Uh, and also uh, get people out of certain practices to understand that, you know, when you have a swamp, it has an impact on how 
uh, you know, your children will be if you enter into the swamp. But again, also you have to look at issues of uh, land. When you go to certain areas where you find that the only land that is available mm. is the wetland for mm. survival. You see, Katesh, uh, there, there are two different cases, what you're mentioning. Yes. Eh? There are some people because of land for food. Yes. And then in area, there are some people because of land for greed. You know, you, you recover land maybe to build a mansion or something. You know, that, that one is impunity. That mm. one is impunity to go and build the, uh, in, a, in a wetland when you know you actually fill up a place. But what I'm saying is that our people need to appreciate and actually to be sensitized. What is the alternative? What can actually be grown in a wetland and what can be, what is not, what is the red line? Because you'll find communities where the only source of land for food is just the, the available place is a, is a wetland and they mm -hmm. don't understand why should I keep it and I starve. For example, there's been a, a debate about the rice in the, in the wetland. When our colleagues, recently our colleagues uh, went to Thailand, and uh, Thailand is growing a lot of rice in a uh, wetland, mm -hmm. right? Here, we are saying, no, 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 growing a rice in the wetland. So people need to understand what is the difference. What is there a crop that someone can survive on in a wetland if it is the only piece of his survival for food security. Mm. But I think for me, these efforts are commendable, but they are just a drop in the ocean. Government needs to be serious with issues of conservation, support NEMA, and reach out to the masses. Okay. And, uh, it's a good time to remind you that you are the government party. Absolutely. And mm. I think for me, the enforcement bit, mm. uh, while we appreciate it, the enforcement cannot give results because you will be scattered. In fact, what people will see is when, when you talk about issues of uh, wetland in our villages, where they give you an example of someone who has reclaimed the yeah. camp, a big shot, mm. and who is not touched. So as uh, I, I would like to advise Nema that if you put community sensitization ahead of enforcement, you actually get more results than getting a stick running around the county. Uh, but if you are to get a stick, then mm. you must start with with those the ones that, that are land filling. Yes. Yes. How do we get wetlands onto Kwasasi? Because you seem to <laughs> 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 you see, you seem to be asking the right. Let me tell you a story about this has happened. This, it has happened this week mm. on our village group. Someone said, "Can the police come and stop the trucks?" Then other people said, "You people, you leave our police out of this. You know, they just cannot manage." These, people, these trucks that are driving in the night. Can you imagine? They are very uh, powerful people. <laughs> mm. I was having a chat with uh, Dr. Barriega before we came on the show. Nema falls under Kosasi. So I told him one of these days, <laughs> we shall invite him <laughs> and his team. We shall to, take videos to, to of Chico movement and, and send to you. Um, you. You see, the challenge with uh, the way the environment has been degraded is... It's a question of impunity because who are the biggest destroyers of our environment? It is the powerful people, very connected. Dr. Barilega here has no control over them. Mm. You know, and, and maybe we'll talk a bit about Kosasi later. So we, as, as interrogating the chairperson of the board of Uganda Airlines, how some of the hiring is done and so on. And the man said, now, chairman, if you were me, what would you do? <laughs> so he was literally saying, my hands are tied. What do I do? Some of these things, they are above me, you know? I imagine doctor here finds himself and his staff in that situation. Some of these people are extremely powerful, you know. Look at Namave. I was having a chat with him about Namave. Just see what's happening in Namave. Factories have come up, and uh, some of these things, I, I don't even know that they are reversible, that they will destroy those factories, you know, to restore the wetlands and, and so on. So we are our own problem. Whenever it rains heavily, most of Kampala floods. Roads are cut off. That's one of the reasons why, by the way, there gets to be traffic. Certain roads are cut off. Cars, you know, they, they begin to swim. Mm. And for the small ones, they literally can't. They stop and wait until, you know, they use other routes and so on. That does not just happen. It's because of what we have done to, to you know, make a reversal of, of, of what nature should be able to do. So when I hear a biodiversity fund, 
Um, I don't know. Maybe it would be good to know what some of their plans going forward are going to be and so on. We have cut down trees because charcoal and so on. Could there be alternatives now that you're talking about biodiversity? Because that's part of conserving the environment. When you're going, you know, past Mavira, we are told Mavira is just, you know, on the road. When you go deeper inside there, there is not, there are villages. People have settled, they have cut down trees and, and so on. So when we continue to do these things, little, little wonder the environment comes again, you know, after us. We, we are the problem. Um, and for me, while I can blame the ordinary people and that kind of thing, I, I think the mighty and powerful are part of the problem. The guys who are meant to implement these things are culprits themselves. So they're not going to do it. You see, in law we say, you know, uh, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. So they don't have clean hands themselves. Mm. They're the ones building factories in Namave and so on. So they're not going to go after smaller, smaller people. So that, that, that's the pre that's boundary problem. that we yeah. have on our hands. By the way, I must say, I, I didn't like your answer when he asked you mm. if you are in my shoes, what would I have done? Mm. Because you said, I'm not the chairman. You could have said you would have refused the appointment. We eventually, <laughs> eventually... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I told him, look, you know, you should have done the right thing, you know, when we had a much lengthy discussion, but there we are. Okay. Honorable Semuju, uh, <clears throat> when you think about Chazanga, when you think about Chira, my village, you, you, there's no tree now in, in, in our place. Um, I don't know whether you should start a tree planting campaign, because even those little things count. You see, Oscar, the... <clears throat> Almost the whole of the country has changed. Mm. In senior five, I went to Lake Mboro, we were a geographic class. Years later, I returned with my children, and there was no Lake Mboro National Park. It is there. These cutaces are we are now using it for grazing. <laughs> because at that time, it was even difficult to reach the smaller lake itself. Now we drove. Up to the lake, there were no animals, nothing. Now, when we had the uh, wildlife authority here, they said they have restored it. Chazang, where I was born, was also near the forest. Because when my mothers begin telling me the story, they used to uh, close uh, and go indoor almost around four because of hyenas. Because you see, the whole of Mukono was a forest. When M7 was fighting in Ruero, they were in Kano Chibirige's forest in Namugongo. Namugongo was a forest owned by Kano Chibirige, he's still living. So that's where Charigonza was hiding. The last report uh, of forest, I think we've lost more than 60% of forest cover in Uganda. My uh, interaction with the forest authority, at that time they said we were losing 9,000 hectares of forest cover and only the plant 3,000. The part of the problem is a governance problem, uh, governance widely, because you see the population of Uganda has increased and it keeps increasing. So that will, because these are poor people who are live because of, of, of tearing. So, they will continue. I, I remember went to Kasese, <clears throat> and the, the MPs from Kasese say the, uh, uh, their people are being chased from a park because of animals. How can you chase human beings because of animals? So they were emotional. So the, these funds they are good, but I don't think they are going to be of any value to a country that cuts tree every day. So you cut 9,000, you plant 3,000. It's just a number of years when you have no tree to speak about. And Nema, in a country with, with governance gaps, uh, even the enforcement itself becomes very difficult. <clears throat> Before you even bring in the, 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 the bigger people who are uh, building and constructing factories in wetland. And I'm seven, we're a country without a culture. There is nothing that is valuable in Uganda. And him is very proud. The last time we were with him on this show, he said that when he came here, followed me here to Gayaza, there was no house. Now he said they have built everything. And he's very proud. Things that are not planned, they just come by themselves. Prosperity. I have told you, Oscar, last time mm. when we went to Sicily, I have trouble pronouncing that word. We understood. Even, even mm. your, own, your own piece of land, 
when they are approving a plan, they will tell you which trees not to cut. They will tell you your house should fit within this space. The rest of the trees, please don't touch your own land. But here, no physical plan, no enforcement, because you're speaking about NEMA, as if there are agencies that uh, may be the one where Katesh worked earlier. I can, I can give you something, a, a current issue. In Shema, there, there's a, an, an investor. Just leave the microphone a little bit. Who came from Tanzania, a Chinese. He has established a, a factory, we are a, let me say a factory, in mm -hmm. the forest to make plywood. And actually, he <laughs> takes the plywood raw materials to China, and uh, they, they, come, they come when they are finished. When I went to Shema, I took interest. I said, let me go and visit this person. And I can tell you, the rate at which people are cutting trees to take to that factory. I, in the I, forest? In that forest. So I asked the, the person, I said, do you have any, any concern that when the old trees are cut down in Shema, you will pack your things and go and leave us empty. I, I, and I don't know which kind of law, what kind of uh, regulation you can use, because people are desperate to, to make money. Mm -hmm. He has his forest. So they just cut it, take and supply, but the place is becoming bare. And uh, this is where I was saying, we need to know what can we tell the communities, what kind mm. of, of sensitization we need to do. That's why okay. we're not enforcing, so, so because it's someone's <laughs> forest. Mm. The communities, no, no, I mean, you see, uh, I remember my, my, one of my biggest disagreements with President Museveni about land tenure. He said it's difficult to plan in Uganda because of the land tenure. But even on your own piece of land, you're going to be issued with a, a building permit. So you cannot say the land tenure is stopping you from planning the country. It's just mm -hmm. an excuse. Because the country, just here in the Indian Ocean, it's an African country. How comes for them they are stopping people from cutting their own trees? And for you here, they just cut even what is not theirs. You see, there is a governance problem in Uganda, and I sympathize with people who take up jobs. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe there is a salary to earn. Uh, I sympathize with people who start funds like, uh, like her because that's where we are. We are, we are like a market, so you can do anything you want uh, until, because you see, the president went to Brantaya and he spoke about Brantaya all the time, how clean it was. Even children, uh, and, and I remember finally, Oscar, I told you here, the first time I visited Gayaza, even when children are going to have lunch, you will see some discipline. Where I went, <laughs> you just pick your plate and uh, you are like animals. <laughs> so the moment you are a country with no culture, no mm. regulation, no value, yeah. we will be coming here every weekend to quarrel because that is having no culture it is who we are now. Okay. The, uh, uh, Agnes, um, how can these funds help in Amolata, for example? Just a quick one. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think for me the, there are two things here. One, and my colleagues have talked about it, is a mindset. Do we actually understand our role and responsibilities as Ugandans on the hearth that we live in? The second issue is, is a planning issue. Look at Netherlands. When you tell me about wetlands, about how they can bring water, it is how God has made it to be. It is upon us to plan how sustainably we are going to use it. Amolatar, I've told you, is a lowland. Meaning, if it is a slashing of rice or what, they should go and remove and say, Amolatar people, go. This is a lowland. It is a peninsula. It's not meant for human beings. But can we do things that the Netherlands, the, the Dutch people did? You know, claiming, reclaiming the sea and building their whole country on a sea and having those water and all that. They, they recognize the environment. They, they recognize it. I would expect that uh, an agency as NEMA should come and tell this country that a molatar for you, God has put you in a low land. You will always have floods and you this will always have drought. This is what you should be doing. Invest money yeah. and do it. And Bududa, yours is God, like this. Yours is like this. Manage it like that. Like this. Manage it like this. Okay. There is no way you are going to you are going to slash that rice tomorrow. You actually I'm called Mama Rice, by the way. Mm. And I grow a lot of rice in a molatar. 
I don't know whether wetland or what, but I grow I grow rice. Yeah. So just come and tell me, show me the best way or, I can or, grow my rice and live killing. with my water. Yeah. Because I God blessed me to be there. Okay. They're not going to remove me. It is not me who made the mistake to be born in a molotov in the middle of two lakes, mm. and water is is part of my life. I, I, I go okay. and drive my canoe, go and collect my water from the lake, come back, live with my water. Show me how to live with that okay. water. Thank you, Honorable Agnes Atim. I have uh, two, two, the, the, Twitter is also busy. This one says, what is taking place in the background at Bang Bang? See, is Katesh well protected? Uh, <laughs> I think Katesh is the one protecting us. Um, and then Edgar Kweteja says, uh, please discuss about, discuss the Luera rice fields, a continuous eyesore and flagrant impunity, Dr. Varegas had. And then uh, Oscar, can you help me ask what Kinawataka swamp soil is being dumped daily? Now, if you would like to make a comment, welcome to gang. The guys and girls have been bonding in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> the seats are not enough for today. Looks I like saw them and I was excited. Yeah. So the seats were not enough. But Oscar, the, the point I, was, I wanted to make is we cannot deny that the biggest threat to the environment is poverty. Mm. And you're asking too much of societies in abject poverty to consider the environment. We go back to man's, man's laws pyramid. Mm. You're telling me not to grow rice so that I die, so that the environment can survive. Mm. Do you see what you're saying? Mm -hmm. How can that even work? So in a country like Uganda, environment, climate change, etc., becomes aesthetic. So now you're, you're working, and like Katesha said, you, 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 it's a dip in the ocean, and you're, you're just, it's, it's like, I get this, this feeling that um, most of our efforts towards the environment and climate change are just uh, so, uh, to make some noise, and to also be part of it, and not to be left behind, and to make the right noises, to get the right funding, and then we move on. Because at the end of the day, look at people who are doing agroforestry. What has government done to help them? When Katesh says they are, they, are, they are cutting down trees in a forest, why would they do that? Because they need it. They need it to survive. It's not even, they're, they're not doing it to get extra money to buy second or third houses. No. They need it to actually do basics like survive and feed their families. So when you ask them to stop that, how about get that very investor, give them another chunk of land, help them grow trees there, so that in 10, 15 years' time, they have trees that you've grown to cut, and everyone survives. You guys, we are at rock bottom. We are surviving. When you start telling us about the environment, biodiversity, do this, do that, and you're talking to someone in Bududa who doesn't even have a latrine or a toilet or money to take their children to school, and you're telling them you can't use this swamp to grow, you know this or that. You think people want to die in Bududa? But yeah. every day they go back to those mountains and risk their eyes because they don't have alternatives. So for me... When you talk about the environment, and then take this to even the international level, fight poverty, and you're one leg there trying to fight the environment. Because you will not have biodiversity or conserve the environment with people in abject poverty. You can Even when you say sensitize them, they, your, your words are going to fall on deaf ears. If you want to do something, maybe we, we have a lot of arable land which has nothing on it. So instead of shutting down that forest, you uh, work hand in hand with these people Oscar. to grow trees in other areas people so who are feeding, people, people who are feeding uh, Chinawataka swamp are not yeah. poor people. Yeah. No, you see, the ones who have planned uh, a factory in Namambe are not poor people. Yeah, but you the, see... The, the, the factory that flooded in Nimbari uh, is not of poor people. Let me, let, let me give you... It's impunity, but let me give you an example. In the first world... They've made sacrifices, like you said, in, in, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. They've actually had to move some of these, these areas and create them in other places to try and survive. Because at the end of the day, do we need the, the Namave factories? The Must they be Namave? No, they can be Namave, but we can create. Yeah. We need them. So you, we have to balance our need, our fight against poverty with this biodiversity. Because the truth is that the environment and biodiversity is aesthetics at our level. Thank you, Nafi. I like it when you're seated here. I can get you to go quiet very quickly. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Bayrega, as we conclude this topic, what do you take from, from the discussion this morning? Yes, Oscar, the, the, the issues being raised are very pertinent. The question of land use, uh, planning and zoning is very paramount. Uh, 
to save the environment. We are not saying we should not use nature. We must use nature because it is there to be used. Uh, <laughs> if you don't use nature, then what is it for? But the point is, can we use it sustainably? If you are from Amorata, and Amorata is a flood plain, and you know that if you grow rice and put chemicals there, when the flood comes, the chemicals will be saturated and they will pollute the lakes, and then you will deny people uh, the right to access clean water, and then you exacerbate their lives by earning money. We can discuss what you can do best there. You can do fish farming, for example, and utilize that water. You can also do rice, actually, on uh, not permanent uh, wet areas, because actually rice does not do well in uh, permanent wet areas. You can only grow rice, actually, on a seasonal wetland or on a flood plain. If you put rice in a swamp, you cannot grow it there unless you drain the swamp, which is a problem. So you can still use your flood plain responsibly. For example, we are now talking of rice growing. We can grow rice without using chemicals or using, uh, there the, the are people who say now that uh, you can actually use organic manure from uh, uh, chicken droppings uh, to fertilize rice. These are a bit safer than, you know, bring chemicals and then flooding comes and the chemicals are saturated and you pollute the entire area. So we are not saying you should not use land, no, or nature. We should use it sustainably. If you have trees, you should be able to cut the trees and earn, provided that there is regeneration of these trees so that tomorrow you don't run out of trees. Like the Honorable uh, Nafka was saying, that factor is important to generate the jobs. But if you finish the trees, then the jobs are themselves threatened. Okay. But if you allow mm. people to continuously supply, uh, then the, 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 it becomes a sustainable issue. Cutting trees on private land has been the biggest problem. If you look at the forest cover loss for Uganda, forests on private land, we've lost almost 80%. Okay. Thank so you, the only thank forests you, we Dr. have is the protected uh, land, mm. yes. So, uh, Lydia, in the studio, most welcome, Lydia, to Capital Gang. What advice would you give to Dr. Helga Reina, board chair, Uganda Biodiversity Trust Fund? You should bring the money here and eat it. <laughs> uh, first of all, maybe they can tell us the profile of the fund, because uh, sometimes the fund can only be good as uh, maintaining salaries of the people they have employed. So what is the profile of the of the fund, and what is the if you unpack the biodiversity, what 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 areas of of biodiversity do you cover? Because diversity is such a broad area um, of of work. So which specifically is that by the that's part, at least for Uganda? What is it that you are, that is that is being done? And is you has Uganda been zoned so that we know the areas of focus? But coming from Bugisu, because someone was talking about Bududa. The, the floods that killed people three weeks ago, two weeks ago, were just actually in the center of town and came from a ridge called Wanale. Wanale, either a rock fell off or there was some big water. It just f came down with high speed and swept away the bridges and we lost a uh, score of people. And all of you have been looking at us as a, 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 a big hump of pity. We, we are looking like a lump of pity. People come from Mumbai and that shouldn't happen. Um, and, and for me, it's about uh, issue of government policy. If you have uh, a fund or an NGO or an organization that is not that is not that is a state a non-state actor, let me put that way, a non-state actor, you you must be part of the government policy. If there was a, a policy statement at Parliament on matters environment, they should, should have been part of it. That you know we are working with these partners, including the Biovasty Fund. But now the policy, the policy statement might, could have gone to parliament on government or even the ministry, and these people of, by, of the fund are not anywhere captured, and yet they are operating in Uganda. Uganda is not an open place out there for anybody to land and operate. I think you must fit the, the you must fit in a, a policy or in a government sector. If you are dealing with the fish, you must be in the ministry of agriculture. If you are dealing with biodiversity, there must be a ministry that talks about natural resources or whatever it is. So I, I think that, uh, if, and I had someone talking about planning. You know that you have the best beautiful plan in Uganda, 
uh, national development no plan three, plan. but there is a big variance the between the national plan. Listen, there's a big <laughs> variance That's between the plan of the country <laughs> and actually what is being implemented in terms of what parliament approves as a, as a budgetary. So where, where does the plan meet the budget allocation? Because you cannot, you cannot run a plan without resources. Yeah. So you. that's where uh, my uh, contribution is. Coordination. Thank you. Having the other guys, a girl here with me means I can take the microphone off her when I want her to stop. <laughs> they, should always, they should always be here. <laughs> yes, it, it works very well. So, Semuja and Lydia, there's uh, Jonathan Ochoma on Twitter says, um, uh, it's not necessarily true that every politician should know about the existence of a particular NGO. Uh, so, Oscar, tell those MPs um, to, to do research on CSOs and how they affect people. Um, okay? <laughs> then we have another one that says uh, about a Fort Porto forest. Um, where are you now? Uh, there's a forest on your way from Fort Porto to Bundibujo. I use that road quite often, and every time I pass there, I witness trucks loading timber. And the funny bit is that there are always people putting on uniform of Uganda police and holding guns. Of course, these are uncorroborated reports. But uh, over to you, Dr. Helga Reina. What, what do you take from this capital gang show? Um, well, firstly, just to respond about you know, some of those questions around what the profile is um, and the areas that Uganda Biodiversity Fund uh, is hoping to support sort of the protection of nature and biodiversity. It is a young fund. We're still growing and prioritizing mobilization of financial resources. But having said that, we have been able to disperse some funds to projects on the ground. And also just responding to, to, to members of the Capital Gang about addressing issues around poverty and how people you know, are trying to make survive and sometimes find themselves being pushed into using the land unsustainably. We do support community-based organizations. We, one organization that we supported in Kam Kamwenge District actually is has, you know, a grassroots organization where the community knew that they needed to protect their environment because they were dealing with these issues of less productive soil. And they themselves brought, you know, created their own nursery to bring back plant diversity and crops, you know, plants that they use even for traditional remedies. And really, when you go and speak to these communities, the, the impact that a project like that, even on a micro scale over short, a short period of time, can be, quite, um, can be quite powerful. So these are some of the ways that the Uganda Biodiversity Fund is trying to direct resources really down to the ground. But not only that, we don't only work with community-based organizations. We are trying to have conversations at, at, at different scales. Um, and in terms of how we think about where do you prioritize you know, directing your efforts, Uganda has identified key biodiversity areas, so areas around the country that are considered to have the most sort of diverse value. Um, and so these are the areas that, at this stage, the Biodiversity Fund tries to direct their resources to. You know, we're still young, we're still small. There are a lot of challenges. I think, you know, all of you around the table here have, you know, have eloquently raised some of those. Um, but at this stage of our journey, we're still having to decide, you know, where we might target target the, the, the meager resources that we have. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to support much more efforts um, uh, to, you know, help have bigger changes. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, we wish you luck with your campaigns. I also wish uh, Dr. Bayrega Kankwasa a lot of luck in, in his campaigns, especially when he visits Chigo. Um, we'll let you go, and uh, we move on to politics uh, right now. So we'll, step, we'll stop for a quick break, and then continue with the show. We'll let you go now. Thank you very much.